Good afternoon. I'm Maureen Reedy, the president and CEO of the Paley Center for Media, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this very special Paley event. Never before has Paley's mission been more vital as media has been the undisputed connector to a nation in these unprecedented times. And Paley is uniquely positioned to meet this moment with impactful conversations led by influential leaders such as our esteemed guests today. Tammy Irwin, Layla McKenzie Dellis, Scott Mills, and John Stanley are driving change and accelerating diversity and inclusion efforts through today's most pressing business and societal challenges. Our program with these exceptional industry leaders will explore their unique approaches to moving the dial from the top and broadening the DNI conversation in the workplace. We are proud to partner with Verizon Business in producing this important conversation brought to you from the Verizon 5G Lab in New York City. And now I am so pleased to introduce our distinguished speakers. Tammy Irwin is the CEO of Verizon Business. She and her team help businesses, governments, and communities reimagine their employee supply chain and customer experiences with digital transformation, technology, and innovation. Tammy leads by example in advocating for equality, inclusion, and accessibility for all. She is passionate about technology's role in improving the ways that we live, learn, work, and play, and is a respected leader on the importance of responsible business. Layla McKenzie Dellis is the founder of Dial Global, a community for diverse, inclusive, aspirational leaders whose purpose is to foster a more open, diverse, and inclusive society by helping organizations to think differently about their work culture, recruitment, attitudes, and understanding of diversity in all its forms. In 2021, Layla also established the McKenzie Dellis Foundation, a charity dedicated to furthering the research and insight into diversity, inclusion, and belonging. This year, we'll see the launch of the McKenzie Dellis Review, a groundbreaking report on diversity and inclusion in the UK and US workplaces. Scott Mills is the Chief Executive Officer of BET, the nation's leading provider of quality content from Black creators. Throughout his tenure at BET, Scott has sparked invaluable change that structured and positioned the legacy brand for tremendous success in a rapidly evolving media landscape. He expanded the BET brand into the multi-platform media powerhouse that it is today with the launches of BET Plus, a premium subscription streaming service, BET Studios, an innovative studio venture providing equity ownership to Black content creators, BET's wide-ranging digital platforms and footprint, and so much more. John Stanley is Executive Vice President of Walgreens Boots Alliance and President of Walgreens. He oversees all of Walgreens operations and is responsible for the development, growth, and management of the business as the company continues to build on its leadership in the rapidly evolving healthcare sector. John also leads the ongoing acceleration and implementation of Walgreens' four overarching priorities, creating neighborhood healthcare destinations, reimagining the company's retail offering, digitizing Walgreens' business, and managing costs and investments. Our distinguished panel is joined by moderator Karen Walker. Karen is an executive coach and consultant who advises CEOs and senior leaders in thriving in hyper growth. She has worked with clients including Aetna, AWS, Pfizer, JP Morgan Chase, and BMC Software, and is an author and contributor to Forbes, Fast Company, and Harvard Business Review's Ascend. Tammy, Layla, Scott, John, and Karen, Thank you. I am truly honored to have you with us today and over to you. Well, I couldn't be happier than to be here today with this particular group of people. Um, I think um, in many ways it's amazing to have this level of talent having this conversation um, and to see the success that these organizations have had with the amount of uh, energy and attention that they have put on this topic. Um, and thank you all for joining us today uh, to, to hear uh, what these leaders have to say. Um, certainly nothing happens in this world without support from the top. Um, and you will see over and over again in this ensuing conversation, I'm sure, how the support of leaders at the top really makes a difference uh, and how the organization will thrive because of it. Um, so I'd love for us to start just with understanding uh, from each of you, uh, what and where did you connect with diversity in your own personal story and your own professional story? 
Um, I know for myself, my aha moment was as an achievement motivated person, I learned I could actually get more done and I could achieve more when I was more inclusive, uh, that everybody didn't think like I or that everyone wasn't just like I am. Uh, and it was a it was a big aha moment for me as a leader in an organization. Um, but I would love to hear from each of you uh, what's true. Um, why don't we start with you, Scott? You can tell us uh, a little about your story. Sure. My may, my may seem a little unusual in that my big aha moment was actually making the transition from investment banking to BET. And what I discovered was, in fact, something that's not obvious, and that is that investment banking is far, mo far more homogenous than BET because the nature of the investment banking machine is that they all recruit from the Ivy League schools. They get these massively driven, overachieving kids who are all motivated towards the exact same goal. And um, so notwithstanding the fact that you might have gender diversity, you might have ethnic diversity, you had, in fact, people who had these very, very common experiences and who, who were all at the same place for the exact same reason. And then moving from that industry to media, where people have far more diverse backgrounds, they enter the business for a host of reasons. Some people aspire to be creative, some people aspire to change the world, some people are business people. It was actually fascinating to discover that, that I had to evolve as a manager to actually be able to inspire and encourage people who were so fundamentally uh, oriented differently than I was. So it was kind of a, a non-obvious example of understanding that diversity manifests in so many different ways. Great, thank you. And uh, I expect all of our stories will be different. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that perspective. Um, Layla, how about you? Well, thank you so much, Karen, for the question. I think. The aha moment for me was when I realized that the world was not quite as equitable as it seemed. I think we all believe and we want so much the world to be an equal place, but until we first recognize that actually equity plays a huge part and the differences, the idiosyncratic details in our background really affect who we are today and how we bring ourselves to the tables as leaders, mm. it's not until we have that moment that we really can fully understand what it means to to be slightly different. And for me, it was being one of only two Chinese children in a white middle-class school. I'm the adopted daughter of two white middle-class uh, British parents, having been adopted when we were uh, children in Hong Kong. And actually, diversity means so many different things to different people. Actually, you know, the, the real change-making moment was realizing actually that these things were positives. Yes. You know, the dyslexia, the neurodiversity, um, the difference of thought, the, you know, marrying a, an American, you know, all of these different things, going through IVF, all of these things make us the leaders that we are. And so actually it's okay to be slightly vulnerable sometimes. It's okay uh, to know that you're a little different. How can we use those strengths in order to bring those to the boardroom? And again, I feel so lucky and so honored to be joined by right. leaders who I've looked up to for so many years who are living these values. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. John? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I guess the short answer is, I don't know if there's one moment. I think it's a, a series of awakenings uh, and a process, you know, for me. And, you know, I started in public accounting, uh, kind of like Scott, a, a, a bit of a service industry that's probably a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, homogenous. And, and then I uh, moved to retail and worked for a, a supermarket operator that operated uh, supermarkets in Southern California, a lot of which were in underserved communities. And as I engaged with that business and learned about the customers and learned about the team members, mm. you know, I think that that was an awakening for me. You know, like you later, I, I actually married a, a woman whose family is from Taiwan. So we just and it just kind of goes from there and builds and just, you know, through a series of experiences, you know, when I think about diversity, it's I think constantly growing and changing and 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 the understanding is developing for me. So I think it's a bit of a journey, but probably started early in my career. Yeah, and then you're able to bring that into your work, which is fabulous, Absolutely. yeah, great. 
All right, Tammy. Yeah, I, I think John, like you, mine is not an awakening, maybe an everyday awakening. It, it does feel like a journey of really trying to understand how do you create equity? How do you create opportunities? How do you embrace and unlock the full potential of everyone around you? Um, and I, I grew up in a very small farming community. My father was a physician, but we were exposed to a lot. Mm. Um, but we were taught pretty early and often that everybody was important. There was no such thing as you're better because of. And so um, I remember being part of a good telephone company, we went through diversity training very early in my yes. career. And I remember being surprised by it. Like, why Why are we going through this? I don't understand because mm. I thought everybody kind of had that expectation. And I've certainly learned over the years. And I think in particular, becoming a mom mm. and recognizing you couldn't, you really didn't bring that to work. You maybe brought a picture of your child, yeah. but you didn't talk about the conflict you might have with daycare. And all of a sudden you begin to see these daily awakenings of how we've got to find a way to unlock the full potential of every human being. Um, there's lots of ways to do that. We'll talk about that. I, I'm a big believer that kindness is at the core of that. Yes. Respect is at the core of that. So for me, I feel like every day I wake up and I'll give you one example. I was in Mobile World Congress a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago and it looked very ubiquitous. It looked like a lot of men and very few women. Mm. There was not a lot of racial diversity. And so you begin to realize that you have these moments when you're like, we've made so much progress and yet we have so far to go, to go from representation to feeling like there's a sense of belonging. Mm. And that is the secret unlock. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and yet, uh, and I think yet. is a wonderful, yeah. uh, wonderful line for us to use. So today, this event uh, really celebrates uh, this groundbreaking report uh, from the McKinsey Dallas uh, Review. Uh, and it's a fabulous new diagnostic tool for understanding many, many facets of diversity. Um, and I couldn't, uh, again, just very excited about um, the, the output from this and its use uh, for all of us. Um, but why do you think uh, this is the time for this tool um, and what does the report say about the state of today's policies and programs uh, in United States businesses in particular? Tammy, maybe you could start with that. Yeah, where to start? First of right. all, read the report. Everybody yes, needs read to report. read the report. Lila, I think you've got a copy of it uh, in your hand, but fabulous report. The reason I think it's so important is we need to be grounded in the facts. Mm -hmm. When we have facts and clarity, then we can be clear on actions that yield measurable results. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's what it's about. It's about having clarity of where are we today? Um, how do we recognize that we all have multiple components that make up who we are? So it's not just that I'm a woman, but I'm a daughter, I'm a wife, I'm a, um, you know, what are all of the components that bring me to the work environment, that bring me to society? And how do I represent and acknowledge mine and then embrace others? Yeah. Um, and for me, it starts with the facts. Know the facts. When you know the mm -hmm. facts, you can't ignore them. Yeah then you can be clear about understanding what actions you'll take. And I, I think what's changed for me over the last several years is this urgency to act, mm. this urgency to say we can't ignore what's happening around us. And certainly we have felt that momentum growing. I think when you look at the tragic murder of George Floyd, yes. uh, when you look at what happened when we all went home and we had to unveil the who the the whole of who we are, mm. there's an urgency in saying we have to bring out the best of who we are, and it starts with having the facts, and from facts come actions, from actions come results, and then a reset of targets. Yeah. Beautifully said. I think we're at an inflection point now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been accelerated perhaps by what we've been through the last yeah. two years. Um, but uh, just so many parts of our society and our culture coming together mm -hmm. to make this the moment uh, yep. when this has to happen. Yeah. So, and as you say, once you know, you can't not know uh, and you have to take action. Yeah. yeah. I think we're also changing, if I can, kind of what work is. Mm -hmm. Work used to be a place you went. Yes. Work is no longer a place you go. It's what you do. And mm -hmm. we've proven that. And so redefining on how you think about talent, how you think about people, how you think about equality and belonging, I think is such an important topic. And as we redefine what work looks like, mm -hmm. not where we go, but what we do, we have permission, I think, to think differently about how we unlock the best of who we are. Yes, wonderful, thank you.
Layla, something you'd like to add? I think to speak to Tammy's point, and it is a great question, is the world of work is evolving so incredibly quickly at pace. We need to have this persistence. You know, the leaders that we have here have got this incredible transformative power to make change, not only within organizations, but also within wider society. And so ensuring that that is not just at the front foot of many business strategies, but also when it comes to the wider world of our customers, our shareholders, ESG is absolutely coming to the fore, in particular the societal aspect. But we heard um, earlier on in the day that actually the E for the last 10 years has really been something that's been key. S is going to be taking that over as we start to move forward. And this is why leaders and forward-thinking, innovative organizations have this, this dogged persistence of ensuring that this is absolutely front and center of business and customer strategy. Yeah, absolutely, has to be a part of that. Um, Scott, uh, you're in a slightly different um, geographical location than we are. Um, can you say a little bit about uh, the, the ecosystem that you're in? Yes, I, uh, we're very focused on how we use media to help address the really persistent issues of inequity that are kind of embedded in the DNA of this country that we all occupy. And so what we've really done is said that we fit the work being done across corporate America around diversity, inclusion, and equity is critically important work and extraordinarily valuable. And we've thought about what, what role does media have to play in actually supporting um, addressing inequalities. And our view is that we, we know that media is a powerful tool to establish values, norms, beliefs, and perceptions. And so how do we use media to address the false narratives and the prejudicial beliefs that have been foisted upon our all of America for so long? And how do we create devices to counteract that? Because the issue is we can do all of this work and in, in, in there's not a single solution to addressing all of the challenges, but we really do have to try to get to some of the foundational issues driving these inequalities. And so we created this program called Content for Change that was really specifically designed to harness the power of media to tackle the prejudicial narratives and beliefs that are a core driver of a lot of the inequalities that exist in the country today. Mm, yeah. And those core inequalities, of course, certainly show up in this report. Um, and um, wonderful to hear that you have programs that are uh, that are addressing those. Um, Karen, can I pick up on one thing that Scott said that I think is so powerful, Scott, and that is how do you use media for the purpose of storytelling? Mm. Uh, I want to just acknowledge the Paley Media Center and their role in using content to really focus on gender on race, on the LGBT community, and unlock generations of storytelling mm. about how media does play a role in how we think about diversity, how we think about inclusion, how we think about belonging, how we think about redefining the family and redefining yeah. norms. And I just think, Scott, you raised the issue of media as a storytelling vehicle and the power of that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't just acknowledge how Paley is helping to do that in telling that story. Yeah. Story. Excellent, excellent partner. I know for excellent partner uh, for yeah. Verizon yeah. and uh, and for many other organizations. That's great, um, John. How about um, for yourself? What did you find in the report that um, really st stood out for you in terms of what's happening in business today? Yeah, the, I think the you know a couple of things about about uh, the report you know stood out to me. I think one was just all the you know the layers of diversity. You know, as we continue to kind of peel back the onion, I think, and really better understand um, each other yes. and, and those around us um, and the depth of it is, I thought was really quite interesting. And I know you had to go through a, a lot of work to just get the 10 facets mm -hmm. because there are so many, right? Um, just like the one that you and I share. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought that was a very, I think, one very interesting aspect of it. The case studies in the report, actually, I thought were actually quite fantastic. Yes. There's some great information there if you have a chance to, to look at those case studies. But I think, you know, as Carlos talked about earlier, you know, having a plan is really 
critical. Mm. And in order to sort of figure out where you are on your journey, I think the information contained in this report is extremely helpful yeah. to kind of helping navigate your way through that plan. Mm -hmm. And so getting that feedback, being able to kind of benchmark yourself, understand where your business is and, and having visibility to that just helps you, you know, further, you know, build out your plan and address areas maybe of diversity that you just really didn't even see before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So 10 factors seems like a lot when I think about how most diversity programs are set up today, diversity inclusion programs. Um, and yet, um, you know, there are, there are thousands. Uh, and so uh, maybe we'll call these the, the top 10 or the, uh, for what's the, the current 10. Uh, uh, but we have information now. We have, we have data about what's happening uh, in the U.S. and in the world today. And, and with that, we, can, we have something we can benchmark ourselves against. And I think that's one of the most important parts of this, this review and this report for me. That's great. Okay, well, let's turn to um, another question, which is uh, really, why is it important to develop? I mean, why do we pay attention to this at all, right? Why is it important to develop uh, an inclusive work environment uh, and a sense of belonging and equity for all? Uh, I think we uh, all have examples over the last couple of years now that we have the, quote, great resignation going on. Mm -hmm. Um, of uh, one of, and a part of that for sure, part of driver for that is uh, that we we aren't valuing all. We haven't provided uh, a sense of uh, an inclusive uh, place of belonging for all employees. Uh, Laura uh, Baldwin, who's the president of O'Reilly Media, calls this period we're in the great destabilization, uh, which I loved as a term and. And her point is, yes, we have resignations going on. We have a talent war, but, but the impact on the organization is larger even than the impact on the individuals. And that we must really look at the impact long-term uh, when we have so much, uh, so much turnover, so much change in our organizations um, as a result of all of this. So um, how, why is it important to do this uh, in terms of your own experiences? Uh, uh, in the workplace, and how have you how have you built trust and and a sense of belonging? Um, Tammy, maybe you could start with that. Wow, such a wide uh, window yes. of, of a conversation. And one of the things, John, I was listening to you talk is um, you were talking about Carlos, your chief diversity officer, and one of the things I really oh. believe is happening with this kind of awakening, the great attrition mm -hmm. versus the great attraction, kind of the destabilization is that this no, this is no longer a problem for the chief diversity officer to solve. This is a leadership problem. Right. Because unless we unlock the trust of our people, we, we have two pillars in our brand, trust and innovation, and we really lean hard into those with core values of integrity, respect, performance, excellence, accountability, and social responsibility. And when you bring all those together, the responsibility to act and act now mm -hmm. to really be the employer of choice, we have to create an environment where people aren't just represented, mm -hmm. but they belong. And if they don't feel like they belong, they quit. And it, it's that simple. And so it is about understanding, I think 10 is the right number. We have 10 ERGs in our company, employee resource groups where people yeah. can have a sense of belonging, but they can't just belong in those employee resource right. groups. It's my responsibility as a leader to make sure my people feel great about the mission. And that means feedback, that means creating an environment, it means even more difficult in a hybrid environment. Mm -hmm. John, I can only imagine what you've been through with healthcare oh over the gosh. last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, my thanks and gratitude to you and the Walgreens team for everything you've done. Um, Thank you. But, but we have to create these moments for people to feel like they wanna be part of the mission. Otherwise they quit. And I think it's anchored to core values mm -hmm. and it's reinforced with leadership behaviors. And yes, the DE&I officers are good for programs, but it lives at the leadership level. It lives at the human level. And, and it starts with core values and some basic kindness. Yeah, mm -hmm. couldn't agree more. Yeah, John, say more about, uh, about Walgreens and um, what, has, what has gone on for you uh, and how you've addressed it over the last couple of years. Well, <laughs> that's a long story. Yes, do, do you, have a, do you have about, six, about five minutes. <laughs> you know, I, I would say, um, you know, I would say that the pandemic has been um, a reawakening for the purpose mm -hmm. and passion of Walgreens. Madness. You know, we found ourselves kind of right in the center of the storm, if you yes. will. Um, I think we've played a critical role in the communities that we serve. 
by being there, you know, day in and day out through the pandemic with uh, the products and the services and the immunizations and the medicines that our that our customers and patients needed. And you know, there's a lot of talk about you know hybrid work and offices and but the vast majority of our team yeah. is actually out in the communities that we serve and they need to be there every day they don't have the luxury of working from home or or um or or being in a hybrid model and they've and they've shown up they've done absolutely an unbelievable job mm -hmm. and and i think that gets right back to this conversation today in, in, a, in a bunch of different ways but i think one thing i would just touch on is kind of the reawakening is that we're really a service organization. Mm -hmm. You know, the products on the shelves and the pill and the bottle can almost be a bit of a distraction. It's really about the way our team members have the opportunity to either interact with or take care of our customers and mm -hmm. patients when they engage with us. Um, and and that really came back to the forefront, you know, yeah. during the pandemic that, that that service is there. And the only way that can really happen in a, in a business like ours is in an, with an engaged workforce, with people who, who, who feel included, with people who feel empowered, who feel like they're gonna be treated fairly. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't create that environment for them to work on, they'll never you know, achieve the, the interaction we want or the experiences we want with our customers and, and patients you know, the way we aspire to have them be. Yeah. So it's foundational, I think, DE&I to what we're trying to do. And if we don't, if we don't keep pushing along and, and learning and developing and engaging, then we're not going to get to where we want to go. Yeah. Well, it removes the sort of the cognitive dissonance that would go on between uh, your front line and me, yeah. right? And, and your customers. And so when they show up and they, they feel respected, they feel like they belong, they're there with a sense of purpose. Um, it changes the experience everything. that they have then with our, with our customer, yeah. right? Or a patient. And yeah. that's, that's the engagement that we're just striving yeah. to get to. Yeah. We're not perfect. We have a lot of things to figure out on this journey, mm -hmm. but that's where we're striving to get to. Yeah, wonderful, great. And Scott, um, tell us about uh, what's gone on at BET uh, in terms of how you've uh, created a sense of inclusion and, and trust, belonging um, with your employees. Well, we work very hard and we recognize that we have a, a, a workforce that is more ethnically diverse than most companies' workforces. But at the end of the day, ethnicity is but one uh, measure of diversity. Uh, so we focus on all of the other uh, manifestations of diversity and work extraordinarily hard to create an environment that's really inclusive and empowering. And it, it's because we coexist in that we are a division within a broader media company. And we're also executives who've been in a variety of industries and we understand the challenges that executives that we've experienced in a variety of industries as well as uh, what our peers experience in industries and so we're very very focused on this idea of how do we play a role to support diversity and inclusion both within BET within the broader company Paramount Global uh, as well as within all of the partners that we have. We have extraordinary partnerships where um, people, companies engage with us initially as a media partner, but ultimately say, we recognize this unusual resource that BET can be because of the, the experiences that the executives there bring to the table, the connection that you have to the culture, the connection that you have to your community. And so, we would like to engage UBET to help us think about how we can uh, address some of these issues within our corporation. Ultimately, we take the position that diversity and inclusion, you know, there is that narrative that it is good for business. We, we feel that it's fundamentally good for business because in its absence, we have to acknowledge that there are artificial barriers and impediments that are precluding people from being equal, equal and active participants in the process. And what that means is that, that those barriers are such that corporations actually are picking from a pre-selected group of people to advance because they're filters that are actually excluding people from being particip for participating in that process. And that's a very kind of uh, delicate way of saying at the end of the day, we have to acknowledge that if corporations are really supposed to be optimizing the talent selection process for the absolute best talent, but that there are things about 
the corporate process that is actually ensuring the pool of people who are being selected are not in fact the best possible pool, that we have to understand that that has an impact on the performance of corporations. And so just as a very practical matter, understanding that it's actually great business to have a truly diverse and inclusive environment, because that means what we're doing is we're allowing the best pools of talent to compete for the most important opportunities. Yeah. Well, such an important point. And uh, I've been working with leadership and leadership teams now for about two decades. And what I've learned over and over again is that it is easy for organizations and teams to hire people just like them. Uh, that's who you know. That's the people that you know, know, uh, for the most part. Um, it's very comfortable. You tend to think alike. There's not a lot of conflict. Uh, and, and you have tremendous blind spots when you do that. Uh, the best teams, the teams that solve problems the best, the teams that make the most headway, um, the teams that um, tend to get things done for the long term are teams that are diverse and that have many different uh, aspects um, of diversity and inclusion uh, within the team. Uh, and um, you're absolutely right. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Scott. Um, Layla, is there anything you would like to add um, on this point? Uh, maybe something from the report or your own experience around belonging and trust? Well, what I would say is listening to all of the remarkable leaders yes. share, the golden thread that's weaving throughout is that engagement seems to be absolutely at the core and center of all of this. You begun the question um, talking very much about the great resignation and flipping that on its head is now all about the great retention. Yes. How can we ensure that engagement is at the heart and soul of that? Right. And each of yeah. our, our wonderful leaders has spoken to that. We've talked a lot about the sense of belonging. Um, you know, the statistics, I, I, I believe, are, are rather crazy is, you know, those that feel in a an environment where they don't belong spend 30% of their time worrying about how they will fit in. And I think each and every one of us can remember a time, whether we walked into a boardroom, whether it was a time in our childhood where we felt we didn't fit in. Now, imagine if that 30% were to go into productivity in the workforce right. and engagement, if we weren't worrying about that. And really, it's, uh, it's just really inspiring to hear um, that each of our leaders are not only inspiring that in the customers that they serve, it makes me think very much of servant led leadership, mm. which I know is a, you know, huge passion subject of yours, Karen, but also um, how we can really affect change within our organizations by speaking out because our leaders are expected now to speak out about societal issues. They often stay within the organizations they work in because of their leaders, because they believe in the yeah. values that the leaders have. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, just as there are many layers to the onion, I think John said about uh, uh, different types of diversity that we should look at. Uh, there are all of these layers to the onion of, of why a business would want to pay attention to this, right? And so one is definitely uh, engagement and retention. Um, others are uh, innovation and creativity, for example. Um, um, and what are some successful initiatives that have been used uh, within your organizations uh, that have been driven by diversity that you fostered at your company? Um, Scott, is there something you'd like to start with there? Different initiatives? Sure, I think there are a couple. I, I think there are a couple, so I'll try to be brief. Um, one that I think was is really, ex we're extraordinarily excited about because I think it shows this fabulous partnership between BET and our parent company, Paramount Global, was that when we made the decision that we thought it was the right time to create a studio to attract black creators to come and work with BET and work with the broader Paramount Global ecosystem to create content across all of our internal platforms and to sell the external platforms. We were doing this at a time where, because of all the things that we've all talked about, there was extraordinary demand for these top black creators. And so the issue became, or the, or the challenge became, how do you create a value proposition to these creators that really stands out relative to all of the other places that were pursuing uh, partnerships with them? And we really delivered two value propositions that couldn't be replicated elsewhere. One value proposition was this idea that you could come into the BET and the Paramount Global ecosystem and as a result have the opportunity to make content for a broad array of platforms 
but that you'd be working with an organization that really understood and deeply respected you as a black creator. And under, and what that means is that understands the breadth of the stories that you might want to tell, the breadth of the experiences that might, you might want to share and the breadth of the characters, because what we were hearing from a lot of creators is that other studios and other platforms would say, well, that's not the black story I'm looking for. Or, oh, a black character wouldn't do that. Or would a character really do this thing? Right. And, and that was really making talent insanely crazy, right? They're saying, really, I have to explain to someone who's not of my community that in fact, a black character would do this, or this is a real black experience. You'd be amazed at how many times this comes up. So that's one. But the other thing was, that because the space was so competitive and people were being compensated extraordinarily well, which is a wonderful thing, we created an innovation that was absolutely unique and remains unique to us. And that is that we said we would do deals that not only provided a uh, traditional revenue stream, but that we would provide talent with equity in the venture itself, in the studio venture. And it was specifically for top black creators. And so we created a vehicle that both supported them from a creative perspective and also supported them from an economic and entrepreneurial perspective. And we, we were only able to do that with the incredible support that we had from our parent company, Paramount Global, because as you know, large companies actually don't like creating complicated equity structures with external equity participants. And so it really was a, a real, it was an extraordinary expression of valuing diversity, valuing uh, this creative community and valuing the opportunity that allowed us to create this innovation that's now working extraordinarily well. And so I think it just speaks to this idea of how do you innovate? How do you use the unique opportunities and insights that you have to create new opportunities for people? Mm. Well, it's a powerful way of demonstrating value and uh, obviously very successful for the organization, right? Um, so thank you uh, for sharing that example with us. Uh, quite inspiring. Um, John, anything you would add from Walgreens? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, you know, we, um, we want to really reimagine local health care. Mm. And, and um, part of that is addressing health equity. And there's a, you know, there's uh, like your organization, we have business resource groups, you know, throughout yes. our throughout our company. Um, but there's a grassroots effort to really change um, health equity in Chicago and a team of, uh, you know, of, uh, of Walgreens uh, team members came together to really build a model to help tackle health equity uh, in Chicago and really brought additional access and services into communities in the Chicago area that I, they just another, never would have otherwise you know, gained access to. Yeah. And I think really drove um, change in that community. And it wasn't a, you know, a top down sort of, right. here's what we're going to go do. It really, it really you know, came from team members who worked in those communities and team members involved in various aspects of our healthcare model, really just joining together and that model really pivoted into uh, uh, an equity effort around immunizations, mm. where we got into a wow. ton of communities across the country and, 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 and provided access to folks who had very social barriers mm. to getting a vaccine. We educated, we provided transportation, we drove into local communities to deliver these vaccines. And, and so I think our organization, you know, really from, a, you know, probably a number of different forces inside the organization, but in large part, just from our team members really wanting to engage mm -hmm. in it, uh, I think are really driving um, changes in local health care and, and delivering solutions to health yeah. equity today. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that it didn't start at the top. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I love that the, uh, the workforce felt like there was, a, there was support for it, right? Absolutely. Uh, there was the freedom to do the right thing uh, and to make a difference. Um, so, um, wonderful. Very powerful stuff. Yeah, exactly. Great. Tammy, how about at Verizon? Yeah, a um, couple things. And let me just acknowledge and thank you for, I, I think this tie the two conversations of belonging together, because when people feel like they can do something other than what they're there at work to do, when they can volunteer, when they can get engaged with their coworkers, it re-engages yes. them in the mission of the business. And, you know, what great, better example than health equity 
and letting them find a way to make that happen. So I, I think it ties back to the conversation of attrition exactly. and attraction yeah. and purpose and belonging. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is a program that we started five or six years ago called WOW. Mm -hmm. um, originally called, it stood for Women of Wireless when we were a wireless business and a wireline business. Uh -huh. uh, now we have a new orientation. It's called Women of the World. So we've kind of taken a broader scope to it. Mm -hmm. um, but it started out of my recognition and awareness that I was at a recognition event that I was hosting and there were probably a thousand people there, Karen, and I had this moment of awakening. Oh, that's a, an awakening moment okay. where I realized that 85% of the people we were recognizing for sales, top sales performance were men. Mm -hmm. And as I saw it and I observed it, I did a double click when I got back into the office and I realized that our structure was set up to really encourage men to be successful. Mm. And that by nature, women tend to be less risk averse. They're not willing to take the same kind of risk. They don't want to put comp at risk. So be a quota ba bearing compensation. Um, they didn't have the same kind of flexibility of hours. They didn't have the same kind of, kind of brand equity mm -hmm. and confidence. And we put together a whole program that was a, a program that you, self-nominated, said, I want to participate in this program. So you had skin in the game. Uh, we took women through a full year-long program. Mm. And this was not women talking to women. We had men actively engaged in this conversation about how do you change the narrative for women building a personal brand, creating good communication skills, confidence building, all the things we all need. Yes. Um, and we tailored it towards women and sales. And we've seen such incredible improvement in the mix of sales employees and sales leaders. And now guess what? They feel like they belong. Yeah. And so it's we've now scaled up from sales into service mm -hmm. in a broader kind of program. But it does take what is the problem? Mm -hmm. Then figure out the grassroots. What can you do at the grassroots and then scale it and continue to refine it? And I'm super proud of that program because it is changing how women at Verizon feel like they can show up on behalf of what they choose to do mm -hmm. and how they choose to do it. Yeah. So. And they feel like they belong because they do belong. They do belong. Right? Right. Uh, you, you, they just didn't you know saw they could them. declare it. Yeah. Exactly. And you've given them a voice yeah. and unlocked the potential of the organization. Yeah. Yeah. You gave them a choice. Yep. You saw them. Yep. And you addressed uh, a societal, cultural issue that we have yep. uh, and um, gave them an opportunity and they stepped up, of and course. Now yeah. we'll rinse and repeat. People yeah. that have graduated from the program become squad leaders for the next year program. And it's yeah. it's viral and it's, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. It's wonderful. It's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's mm -hmm. great. Um, yeah. So let's talk now about uh, DEI and business at, uh, sort of more specifically. So... We hear that DEI is good for business. We've given a couple of examples here. Um, uh, SAP's Chief Sustainability Officer, Daniel Smith, uh, has run a very successful program. And uh, he had this great quote. He said, uh, uh, there's sustainability or there's no business, right? Uh, uh, and they have embedded the idea of sustainability, which includes DEI efforts uh, in their core business strategy. And um, he, he said, we have, quote, high strategic relevance. Uh, and, and employees get feedback all the time on how they're doing on, you can imagine at SAP with um, their, uh, their systems, uh, sort of feedback that they're able to give people uh, about how they're doing on, on many different dimensions. And it's, it's like every quarter they get this feedback on what's going on. Uh, and it is, it is embedded in their, their core business strategy, and it has enabled them to not only make a difference, but to be more successful and to influence their, their clients. Um, so um, what more needs to be done? I know that, that you are committed to this. I know your organizations are committed. I heard the aforementioned Carlos say earlier that, you know, that, that what SAP is doing is really what you're doing. It is embedded uh, in your core business strategy, but what more needs to be done in order to really drive change and create sustainable results? 
Um, Leila, I'd like to ask you to start with this. Well, thank you so much for the question, Karen. And first of all, I must say, I take my hat off. Right. I normally say virtual hat off, but actually it's an in-person hat uh, today uh, to John at Walgreens for the brilliant healthcare equity initiatives, which are really grassroots up. And also uh, with the work that Tammy and Verizon are doing to really put in these interventions at every single yes. layer to break the system that has been um, preventative in the past. But as you say, Karen, this is, you know, this is about how uh, we can really keep the momentum on and we can affect change. And one of those ways is by bringing together forward thinking leaders and organizations and, you know, Scott and all of our um, external um, content producers and such in order to drive this momentum. We've been talking a lot about collaboration over competition, and I think none such has been so true in the modern world that we live in, where um, best in class only exists for a very, very short period of time. Actually, it's leading practice, diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity. It is this constant evolutionary process that is constantly, you know, it's moving. Our children, our children's children, future generations of leaders, I'm quite sure will look at this as incredibly different. And so looking at this in a collaborative, yeah. to your earlier point, sustainable way to leave this legacy, the only way is to collaborate because the world moves so quickly. And, you know, technology, um, you know, Verizon's um, brilliant networks allow us actually to be able to connect at a far greater rate than uh, perhaps right. ever before strategic partnerships that we have um, between organizations that have the same purpose at the core, but keeping that momentum on and making sure that we hold each other accountable. Um, you know, CEOs in particular, we see, um, you know, are now being expected to talk out about societal issues yes. when 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. It was, you know, we've moved from this archetypal white ivory towered um, stereotype to the modern humanistic led leader where CEOs who are successful, they really are those that have got incredibly high emotional intelligence and connectivity yes. that allows people to, to want to believe in their mission, their passion and that of their organization. So um, I think keeping momentum on, keeping the pressure on, making sure that we inspire, we educate, we motivate, that we look at this as more of a collaborative effort as opposed to a the buck stops here. It's like right. culture. It lives, it breathes, it sleeps. We got to keep, keep moving on. Yeah. Wow. So powerfully said. Thank you. Wow. Um, Scott, uh, you've given us examples of how much you are doing, uh, and, uh, and, and yet there is so much uh, more to be done. Um, what do you believe needs to be done in order to continue to drive real sustainable change and get results uh, in this area? I think there are two things. I think one is we have to appreciate how critical change management is to this process. We are, we are actually asking human beings to do something that does not come naturally to them, right? And we have to really understand how foundational this change is. And simply giving people metrics and establishing goals is not in it of itself going to be sufficient to drive the type of change. There's an extraordinary, extraordinarily successful CEO who recently retired will go down in history as one of the best CEOs in corporate America without question. And that CEO has been widely celebrated for just, just creating unbelievable value at the company that this CEO ran. And when they left, they acknowledged that, well, the one thing I didn't do is I didn't make much progress on diversity. Right. And the point was, it was kind of OK. It was like, mm, OK, but all the other stuff that you did was so awesome that that's OK. And I know we probably have a time issue here, but I'll, so I'll be brief. But the what's striking to me is that idea that we a lot of organizations will say this is important. But what frequently happens from my perspective around diversity, equity and inclusion is that it's one of a suite of priorities. And when the other priorities become at risk or under pressure, it's diversity, equity, inclusion is the one that typically companies are willing to forego uh, it to achieve the other priorities. And we have to we have to figure out how to change that dynamic. Hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Um, so we are winding down. Tammy, I'll throw the last question to you. Um, uh, how can leaders build and capitalize on momentum, the momentum we have now, yep. uh, to transform not only their companies, uh, but also industry at large? Yeah, I think it, that, Scott, your story is really interesting about a CEO who was allowed not to participate. That's no longer an option. Right. Uh, when we think about DE and I, and we think about the great unlock for how we serve all four of our stakeholders, it is about not just diversity representation, but diversity belonging. Yes. And I, I think it is the biggest unlock we have right now as we think about how do we serve employees, customers, uh, shareholders and society at large. It touches everything we do. And I think about Lila, this concept of collaboration. We've got to work together, private, public, to really expose what must be true to drive sustainable change. And then we have to measure it. Yes. We do have to say, are we making progress? I'm with Scott. I'm a little mixed on quotas, but we've got to measure it and we've got to hold ourselves accountable. And I think that's what CEOs are doing so differently is saying, I'll measure it. I'll action it and I'll come back and hold myself accountable and my team accountable. Yeah. And wow, what a difference it makes because now it's everybody's responsibility. It's no longer the chief diversity officer. They're great to build programs yep. and unlock, but it's my responsibility. It's a culture. It is an mm -hmm. unlock against delivering great results. And yeah. I think the CEO of the future will say, the thing that enabled me to deliver great results was having great diversity great inclusion and great sense of belonging and unlocking the full potential of my organization wow. through people. Yeah. Well, couldn't have been more beautifully said. So thank you for, for ending on that note for us. Um, I, would, I would just close by saying that beyond being morally the right thing to do, uh, which, you know, we all have an intention about doing the moral right thing, uh, valuing differences and, and, and doing the right thing also makes the results richer. Uh, when we only look through a narrow lens, we have a lot of blind spots. Uh, and using diverse perspectives really helps us be able to better plan, adapt, uh, and get the kind of results that uh, both we and our employees uh, need and in these days demand. Thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you, panel. You're just phenomenal. Thank you. Just take my, my hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.